Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, what will be our last um, program for 2022. Um, uh, for all of you, uh, I made a mistake last week uh, regarding this, but um, next Friday, uh, there will not be um, a Friday morning program, and we'll start up again um, the first week of January. Um, we are really honored and um, uh, I'm terribly excited uh, about our guest this morning. Dr. Cord Sturgeon um, is the Chief of Endocrine Surgery at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. He is also Vice Chair of Surgery for Northwestern Medicine. Um, he wears many hats. He is the Director of Surgery for Northwestern Memorial Hospital Surgical Services. And he is also Physician Director of Informatics for Northwestern Medicine. Um, he is also at a national level, level uh, currently serving as president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Sturgeon uh, for uh, um, this morning's lecture on a topic that I think is one that we as clinicians don't spend that much time uh, thinking about, and that is the financial burden of a diagnosis of thyroid cancer on them, um, on the survivors. Um, I'm joined this morning by Dr. Camilo Gonzalez Velasquez, um, who uh, will be a part of the panel and um, is joining us from Mexico. And so with, no, uh, with that in mind, I just wanna welcome everyone and also ask that you uh, send in your questions um, and we will do our best uh, to get to those before the end of the hour. Um, so, Dr. Sturgeon, thank you once again, and um, uh, we can go ahead and get started here. Good morning. I'm Cord Sturgeon. I'm the Chief of Endocrine Surgery here at Northwestern University in Chicago. I'd like to thank the Foundation for the invitation to talk to you today about financial toxicity and thyroid cancer survivors. I have no financial disclosures. The next few slides will be the take-home points for today's talk. And uh, if uh, this is the only part that you uh, pay attention to, um, this will get you there with everything you need to know about um, financial toxicity. So the first point is uh, that a cancer diagnosis is financially destabilizing. It's been shown many times. Uh, any cancer diagnosis you have puts you at risk uh, for uh, financial burden or financial distress. Uh, so it should be quite clear that um, there are many ramifications of a new cancer diagnosis and uh, financial issues are certainly uh, one of them. In fact, 40% of Americans cannot cover an unexpected expense of over $400. And we know that cancer care costs a lot more than that. In this study from the Federal Reserve on um, the economic well-being of U.S. households between 2017 and 2018, we found that a $400 emergency expense uh, would probably be put on a credit card by most people and then paid off over time. Uh, about 25% of respondents would have borrowed from a friend or family member. Nearly 20% would have sold an asset. And some are even using payday loans for a $400 uh, expense. So I think this tells you a lot about how close people are to the edge or how, how budgeted they are um, uh, from week to week. The probability of financial burden in patients with a cancer diagnosis is about 50%. Uh, several studies have shown this as well. So that's a pretty high prevalence. Uh, and this is any cancer diagnosis. Thyroid cancer is what we're gonna talk about today and survivors of thyroid cancer have a 3.5 times higher rate of filing for bankruptcy protection than survivors of other cancers. Now this data is mostly from uh, one uh, research group in the state of Washington that has linked together some uh, unique data sets to identify patients, uh, cancer diagnoses and uh, filings in the court system. Uh, and uh, these two papers are worth a look. Uh, uh, they're both very interesting and I think shed a light on how um, cancer diagnoses uh, link to financial burden and other financial events. And financial distress is associated with poor quality of life in thyroid cancer survivors and other 
uh, survivors of other cancers. The uh, Mongelli paper uh, is what I'm quoting from here, and we'll, we'll review this in greater detail uh, during the talk today. Finally, this uh, formula here uh, should be easy to kind of think about financial burden plus financial distress uh, equals financial toxicity. It's a sum of these two things. And the, our goal as healthcare providers should be to reduce or eliminate financial toxicity, uh, or should, we should be prescribing treatment regimens uh, or courses of action that, uh, that do that, as opposed to those that continue to amass greater and greater financial burden. A few definitions to start out with uh, today. Financial burden is a material condition that's definable in currency, like um, $1 million financial burden, for example. Financial distress, on the other hand, uh, is a psychological response to that increased uh, financial burden. Financial toxicity, the sum of those two things, material and psychological, and the National Cancer Institute defines it as the phenomenon of adverse financial effects of medical treatment. Financial hardship, on the other hand, has a legal definition when the debtor needs substantially all of their current and anticipated income and liquid assets to meet current and anticipated ordinary and necessary living expenses. That's a mouthful. And I try to steer away from legal definitions in medical talks. The NCI would call it the problems a patient has related to the cost of medical care. And we'll focus today on burden, distress, and toxicity. And these would be the terms that we'll use. The aspects of financial toxicity, well, there's, of course, material conditions such as out-of-pocket expenses, productivity that's lost because you're not working. Uh, there's a subsequent reduction in income and, and potentially loss of assets or net worth. As medical debt accumulates, you, you're at risk of defaulting on bills and loans and filing for bankruptcy protection. Psychological responses include or are driven by Concerns about paying those bills that are piling up, uh, affording the care that you need, uh, losing work, maybe you're getting fired or, or losing hours because of the cancer treatment. And coping behaviors, as, as we saw during the pandemic, people delay or forego their medical care uh, when it's expedient to do so. And uh, we saw the consequences of that with people presenting with more advanced disease or more uh, limited treatment options for those diseases when they're advanced. We've also known for a long time that uh, patients on a tight budget, uh, when they are faced with the choice of paying for food or paying for medications, they choose food. Uh, this just you know, makes sense. Uh, and so uh, these are the behaviors that uh, we're looking out for. Where does the financial burden come from? Mostly out-of-pocket costs. And cancer survivors report a higher out-of-pocket expenditure than those who don't have a cancer history. There's also lost productivity uh, because you can't work sometimes when you're having you know, surgery or chemotherapy or whatever it is. In this study, uh, labor market earnings dropped by 40% after a cancer diagnosis. Family income dropped by 20% at three years from the diagnosis. Unemployment rate increased by 9% also in the same time period with no recovery seen in those patients still alive at years four and five. Asset depletion also is pretty common, about between a third and 80% of uh, cancer survivors have used up their savings to finance medical expenses. And medical debt will accrue over time as well. And somewhere between 1.2 and 3% of cancer survivors uh, will file for bankruptcy protection within five years of their diagnosis, according uh, to the Washington State Database. Financial burden, financial stress are actually very common. Uh, I'll go through about six studies really quickly. Uh, this first survey, a small group of 147 patients who had thyroidectomy for cancer. This is actually a pretty well-off group. 81% had private insurance, 50% had a six-figure uh, annual income. And 16% uh, of that group reported financial burden. That's not a trivial uh, slice of that group. 50% of all thyroid cancer survivors report financial stress. It's different. If you start out with financial burden, of course, you've got a higher uh, uh, risk of having financial distress. And if you don't have financial burden, a lower risk, but there's still pretty high numbers here, 43 and 87%. Interestingly, or de perhaps depressingly, the Massachusetts healthcare reform 
bill in 2006 and Obamacare in 2010 uh, had no impact on uh, financial burden. In the, this National Health Interview Survey, uh, they looked at uh, the relationship between uh, financial burden due to cancer and the quality of life in around 2,000 patients, and they found that thyroid cancer had the largest proportion of patients reporting the highest degree of financial burden, about a third of them. In uh, this 2011 MEPS paper, uh, big numbers here, 470,000 thyroid cancer survivors. They're pretty young, not 53 uh, years, 95% uh, nearly are insured. The rate of psychological hardship is nearly half, financial burden over one fourth. If you look at other cancer survivors, there's a group of 7 uh, million uh, that were reviewed an older group, mean age of 69, uh, a much lower uninsurance, uh, uninsured group. So this is 98, 97% insured. Look at their psychological hardship is about half, 24%. Financial burden, a lot lower, 20%. So as, as you get older, the probability of these cancer diagnoses leading to psychological or financial hardships uh, goes down, and I'll try to uh, draw that link in a couple other papers as well. In this Livestrong survey from 2012, 4,700 cancer survivors, two-thirds of them were worried about paying their bills, a third of them had gone into debt, half greater than 10,000, and the bankruptcy protection filing rate was around 3%, uh, and it was driven by a younger age, lower income, and being on public health insurance. In uh, another MEPS paper, financial sacrifices were more common in the young, and uh, income, education, and uh, race and ethnicity uh, were factors. In the Mongelli study, they surveyed over 1,700 thyroid cancer survivors, found that they reported financial difficulties at a high rate, unemployment was 12%, and the quality of life was lower for people with those financial uh, difficulties. So a little bit more uh, detail to try to explain or connect why people who are having financial difficulties have a lower quality of life. I think you can start right here. Have been contacted by collection agency, 16%. Uh, taking out uh, loans, 4%. Uh, 3% um, have declared bankruptcy. 12% maxed out their credit cards. Around a fourth of them used up all of their uh, savings to pay for their care so far. So these things are at are components or aspects of their financial burden. You can see how that impacts quality of life as well. 55% of cancer survivors in the U.S. report at least one domain of toxicity. Uh, if you look just at thyroid cancer survivors, uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, in this first study uh, from uh, 2021, they looked at the costs or the charges for thyroid surgery and found that um, the annual increase in charges is around 4.3%, and over a nine-year period, 38.8%. So it's getting more expensive, or the charges at least are getting higher for having thyroid surgery. Most of the costs for, uh, you know, they're attributed to a, a new cancer diagnosis or accrued in the first year after being diagnosed. So in, in this, in these next two studies, in the first year, the attributed cost is 15,000. Uh, first five years is 25,000, lifetime is 34,000. So that tells us that the things that happen to you right after you're diagnosed with cancer are expensive. So that's when you have your biopsy, you have your surgical consultation, you see the endocrinologist, you have your operation, you get your radioactive iodine if you get it. And all of those things are very costly compared to the surveillance modalities that we do. Uh, thyroid cancer survivors experience a greater proportion of material financial hardship and psychological financial hardship compared to survivors of other uh, common cancers. And also the incidence rate of bankruptcy at one year after diagnosis was the highest of all cancers studied in the Washington State database at 9.3 um, filings per 1,000 person years. There's worse health out, uh, sorry, worse uh, quality of life in uh, all uh, cancer patients uh, who have financial toxicity. They uh, also have been found to have increased symptom burden. Uh, in some cases, less satisfaction with care. I'll, 
I think this is controversial. They're not necessarily linked. You can have a big bill from the hospital, but still feel very satisfied with the care that you received or with the doctors that took care of you. Uh, but one area to focus on maybe is less than half of patients report having had any kind of relevant discussion with their healthcare provider regarding financial toxicity or things to come and what it might mean. Also, very interestingly, uh, patients who have a cancer diagnosis and financial toxicity have a higher mortality rate. And it's hard to know if the chicken from the egg here, uh, whether uh, worse cancers get more uh, treatments and more expensive treatments and have higher financial toxicity, or, or maybe just the patients who uh, start out with worse situations or have more risk factors for it have a higher mortality rate. Either way, uh, what was uh, uh, found in this uh, study by Ramsey was that uh, cancer patients who filed for bankruptcy had a higher rate of mortality compared to those who did not file for bankruptcy. We have to consider socioeconomic factors as well, uh, factors that um, are associated with financial hardship include a lower household income, it makes sense, um, lower educational atten attainment, uh, race and ethnicity, uh, rural residents, or rurality is what that's called, and also marriage status. So a couple of interesting things to consider in this study uh, from uh, 2014, Spanish-speaking women had a higher risk of financial hardship than English-speaking Latinas, uh, whites, or African-Americans. So the, the language that they speak had something to do with it. And uh, in this study uh, from uh, 2015, African-American race was associated with an increased risk of economic burden compared to white race, uh, but it was only among patients with colorectal cancer. This is not true in patients with lung cancer. So maybe the type of cancer also has uh, some type of additional effect in addition to like race and socioeconomic factor as well. Of course, employment status and insurance status have a lot to do with uh, toxicity. A reduction in employment or a reduction in hours in increases your risk of toxicity. So is recent change in employment. Uninsured patients or those who are private uh, insured or public insured, uh, that uh, uninsured group has a higher uh, risk of toxicity. The high deductible private insurance without health savings account, that situation also puts you at risk for toxicity. Um, policies that have higher cost sharing uh, are associated with non-adherence. So the more it, it costs you uh, to take the chemotherapy, for example, the less that you're likely to take it. Uh, and some uh, chemotherapies are covered by Medicare, some are not. So the type of supplemental coverage is also important. One would think that in uh, countries that have universal health care coverage, that universal coverage might mitigate uh, the risk of financial toxicity. There's been a couple of studies. I picked two from the same group, actually. Uh, this first study on the left, they looked at um, Canada, Australia, England, and Ireland, four countries that have universal health care, and they looked for gaps in support um, for cancer patients and their families. They found that even though there was universal health care in these countries, there's still significant gaps in reimbursement for travel, accommodations, medication, lost income, uh, things like that. Also, uh, Canada has, of course, uh, universal health care, and they found that a significant proportion of cancer patients in Canada uh, struggle financially, have emotional distress, uh, and 40% uh, of the people they surveyed uh, reported these um, uh, issues with their cancer diagnosis, despite their universal coverage. Clinical characteristics uh, that are associated with financial hardship for cancer patients. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, younger age is a risk factor. So those younger people compared to those that, for example, qualify for Medicare. Uh, if, they're, uh, if you are diagnosed with cancer when you're just, uh, less than 45 years of age, it may disrupt your education. Uh, it may uh, have a bigger impact on, on your employment. Uh, this is when you're working hard and you're um, uh, building your career. Uh, you uh, should be paying off debt and starting to accumulate assets. 
uh, but instead you are working less and so you're making less money and you're accruing debt because of the cost of medical care. And also younger people are likely to have more dependents and retired people are less likely to have those. They're empty nesters. They're not working anymore. They're retired and they qualify for uh, Medicare. And so the younger patients definitely have a higher risk factor for financial hardship. It's also, of course, related to where the cancer is in your body, the stage of cancer, how, how rapidly or how slowly it progresses, the type and cost of the treatment that you're receiving, how intense or frequent uh, that treatment is, and also the other medical problems that you have. It's clear that increasing age is protective uh, of both material and psychological uh, burden in patients with cancer. Uh, and uh, what's been looked at specifically for thyroid cancer patients, yes, older age is associated with decreased financial burden. This is uh, 2022 data from SEER. Uh, what I want to point out here is that uh, around 80% of all thyroid cancer patients uh, fall in this age category where they don't qualify for Medicare. Uh, only 20% uh, are diagnosed at age 65 or higher. You can see the median age of diagnosis is 51. 21% uh, roughly of uh, patients are diagnosed between 45 and 54 and an equal amount between 55 and 64. And then there's, of course, this big group down in the early age range. Uh, so thyroid cancer is uh, mostly a disease of younger people who don't qualify for Medicare uh, and are in the upswing in their life. Younger cancer patients have a higher rate of bankruptcy than older patients, about two to five times higher. And this is due to lost wages uh, because they're not working in the post-operative period or around radioactive iodine. Young people have a higher debt to income ratio. They're in general less likely to have access to high quality health insurance like Medicare, and they don't qualify for those types of benefits. Any cancer will double the risk of bankruptcy. And this is shown in the Washington state data. But thyroid cancer carried one of the highest risks of bankruptcy, 3.5 times higher than others. And interestingly, most patients file bank for bankruptcy protection in the first year following their cancer diagnosis. So it hits them pretty hard, pretty fast. Factors associated with financial hardship in uh, thyroid cancer survivors include, uh, and these are things that are specific to thyroid cancer treatment. The extent of surgery, so more surgery, probably more uh, costly. Uh, medical treatments, uh, if you're getting uh, a TKI, for example, chemotherapy, radioactive iodine, um, all of these uh, lifelong thyroid hormone, et cetera, all of these medical treatments have costs. The more intense, frequent, or, or the longer that your surveillance period is, the higher your costs. Uh, radiation like external beam or REI also add costs, and so do systemic therapies, as I mentioned earlier, like chemo or TKIs. So what can we do about this? Like, uh, what can be done about uh, cancer patients' financial toxicity? I'm going to go through a number of levels of, you know, to look at, you know, here on this page of the patient and provider level, but there are many different perspectives to look at this from. At the patient level, what can be done? There are patient assistance programs and drug savings card programs. Uh, we're probably familiar with uh, programs that help with transportation to and from uh, healthcare uh, settings. There's also Ronald McDonald House and other housing assistance programs out there. The level of the provider, we need to ask patients if they want information, advise them about these options, refer them to professionals, uh, and refer them to resources that can help them. Uh, using financial navigators more in the healthcare setting might also be uh, beneficial. Improving uh, the, co the communication that we have with uh, patients and improving uh, the content of our discussions about costs of care, risks of financial burden. And I think this is important to consider. Like The day that you diagnose somebody with a cancer, their risks of well, financial burden or distress are actually lower than it is down the road as they have lost income from not working or they have higher debt from um, their medical bills. So these discussions about these risks need to be ongoing because their, their profile will change over time. 
I think we also need to improve cost transparency, but the, it's controversial whether this is actually helpful at the provider level. Do we actually order things that are less expensive, for example? And as providers, we should be thinking about treatments whenever this is possible that will minimize lost wages and reduce the chance of losing, you know, for example, losing their job. Uh, so they lose employer-based insurance. Uh, we need to think through these things a bit. And there are some choices you can make that are more toler tolerated better um, uh, for people who are actively working. At the level of the employer, there are uh, a number of benefits that can be considered like making health insurance available with multiple coverage options that are more affordable. Uh, paid sick leave or just any sick leave in some cases, workplace accommodations, uh, retirement or severance benefits that are available. At the payer level, they're investigating value-based payment models. This is a very hot um, topic, quality of care driving uh, payment, uh, paying or tying together out-of-pocket costs for patients to uh, value of treatment so patients can pay less for um, selecting high value treatments that pay more for selecting treatments that are of less value or have less scientific backing. Uh, also uh, improving the depth and breadth of provider networks and providing details about out-of-pocket expenses, um, I think are important things to do for the payer. State and national policy also is something that we need to look at. Of course, the Affordable Care Act in 2010 uh, is one of the biggest examples of this, which established marketplace uh, coverage or marketplaces where you could purchase insurance, set standards for health benefits, eliminated pre-existing pre condition exclusions, eliminated some lifetime and annual coverage limits, allowed uh, kids to stay on their parents' insurance until they were 26. And for those states that accepted it, Medicaid expansion, and oh, there's a whole host of studies that you can look at showing the benefits that those, those states uh, accrued from accepting Medicare expansion. Price transparency legis legislation is probably uh, uh, going to be helpful as well. And recently in this uh, most recent term of the Senate, they passed a bill on drug price negotiation. So I have a couple of slides on that um, to show you the magnitude of the problem. This, uh, by the way, were provided by my colleague, Peter Kopp um, from the ATA. And the, the first study shows the um, a number of drugs used for advanced thyroid cancer and the year that they were approved by the FDA in the United States, and then the costs in the U.S. compared to those costs in, in uh, similar countries, high-income countries in Europe. And you can see that for Lanvantadib, the cost in Switzerland is, uh, uh, you know, one-third, uh, one-fourth of the cost that it is in the United States, similar issues in Germany, England, and France. Uh, Carbazantinib, same thing. Uh, in England, you pay one-third of the cost that you do in the United States. Huge differences, 18,000 versus three, four, five thousand. 5,000. Uh, and so it's certainly a huge uh, cost differential between the U.S. and everywhere else. And uh, maybe uh, drug price negotiation will impact this. Here's another study. This is from Korea, where they normalize the costs of uh, anti-cancer drugs to uh, Korean uh, currency. And you can see that uh, compared, they also compared all these other countries. The US uh, has the highest price index for anti-cancer drugs compared to all the other countries studied, even when they normalize the data of, by purchasing power of the country is still the US is paying in most cases double what everyone else in the world pays for anti-cancer drugs. What can we do globally? Well, we can diagnose less cancer. And this does sound like a terrible idea, but bear with me because the goal is to avoid diagnosing cancers that are very unlikely to be clinically meaningful. And so I'm talking about here the, the, the tiniest um, papillary micro cancers. Uh, and uh, and not that we would not be diagnosing, you know, bigger or more significant cancers, but avoiding the diagnosis of those that are not significant. So you don't want to screen for thyroid cancer, except for in kindreds that have known um, inherited cancer patterns or known genetic results, for example, but just the broad um, uh, population screening should not be done. 
Uh, rational standards need to be uh, set for uh, biopsy thresholds, such as those that we see in the ACR TIRADS uh, recommendations. We also need to codify the above in guidelines so that people look to it and, and uh, behave in that way. Uh, we have been rethinking the terminology used to describe cancer, for example, the introduction of NIFP a few years ago uh, to replace a, follicular variant of, a certain type of follicular variant of thyroid cancer. But also, I think we need to ask pathologists if they must call out these incidental, for example, one millimeter micro papillary carcinomas. Uh, uh, do all of these things uh, need to be uh, evaluated when they're this small? You know, do we need to get to that high power magnification to know about these microcarcinomas? Individual providers can do something as well. We can treat cancer more rationally. So um, active surveillance may be when appropriate, but not for everybody. Passive watchful waiting when appropriate. We need to limit the extent of surgery sometimes, you know, and ask these difficult questions. Like, for example, could a thyroid lobectomy with five years of surveillance actually be less costly than active surveillance done in perpetuity for your whole life? Well, what about RFA? Could RFA in five years of surveillance uh, what would that look like in terms of a cost uh, compared to active surveillance in perpetuity? I would I would submit that anything done in perpetuity is going to end up being more expensive in the long run. Uh, so these things need to be evaluated, not just as novel uh, things to look at for a few years, but what the long-term strategies actually cost. And I hate to say this, but we need to avoid these costly surgical adjuncts that really don't add value like robotics, uh, for thyroid surgery, remote access surgery of uh, almost all types, uh, and add-on cosmetic procedures that just add cost. Of all the things, though, on this page, if I had to pick one thing, I would say avoiding all complications is what will do the most uh, to um, minimize toxicity uh, and poor quality of life in thyroid cancer patients. And so, therefore, uh, adjuncts that minimize or prevent complications will have value. So that would be like nerve monitoring and those devices that allow you to identify and preserve parathyroid tissue. Uh, those are adjuncts or, or devices that will probably add value. We need to employ rational surveillance strategies when we're going to surveil people, which include things like leveraging telemedicine so that we reduce travel burden and lost, walk, uh, lost work for the patients. And we need to know, we need to do uh, our, our testing frequency uh, rationally, not every, you know, six weeks or something like that, but uh, many patients require testing annually or maybe every six months. And also we need to look at lower cost options when appropriate. And what I'm referring to here specifically is things like generic uh, medications instead of brand name. I'd like to finish with this um, call to professional societies for what they can do for thyroid cancer survivors. And first, I'd say that they need to write guidelines with financial toxicity in mind. So thinking through uh, what the things they're recommending will do to costs and charges and financial burden. Also, they need to advocate for expanded healthcare coverage so that patients can receive the care that they need and, it, and that it's covered. Uh, they should train physicians who will provide expert care close to where patients live because one of the big barriers to receiving care or doing well uh, in your cancer therapy is how far you have to travel to get it. And also, we need to empower patients with education so that uh, they're aware of these financial burdens and can make smart decisions. Well, I'd like to thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to speak to you today about um, this um, a very fascinating topic and very important topic uh, to thyroid cancer survivors. Thank you. Court, thank you very much. Um, that was really a, a terrific lecture and really a, a incredibly enlightening. Um, I've got a bunch of questions, uh, but the first thing I wanted to ask you is how did you get interested um, in, this, uh, in this topic here? Uh, it's, uh, th thanks a lot for that question. Um, it actually was a different disease. It was hyperparathyroidism that got me interested in it. Uh, we were, um, you know, I started out in my professional careers in attending and 
in 2004. <clears throat> and um, you know, I'd finished my training and I was starting to do a lot of parathyroid surgery. And at the same time, there was the approval of a, a new medication to, um, to treat hyperparathyroidism, but it was limited to uh, parathyroid carcinoma and unresectable patients. And it, it just, uh, like most of us are familiar, Sinecalcet. And we were really interested in what the uh, cost of treatment would be if patients, uh, instead of having surgery, uh, were given Sinecalcet and then monitored in perpetuity. It was really low-hanging fruit in retrospect and just thinking about things that essentially any uh, disease that you can pick that has a uh, surgical treatment with a very high cure rate uh, and, and low complication rate is going to be less costly and more effective than any uh, pharmaceutical treatment that is done in perpetuity that costs you know anything more than a just a small amount. And so this uh, you know kind of changed the the conversation uh, when these types of studies started to come out and people were looking at um, actually uh, it's not very cost effective or or even for that matter very effective. Uh, to choose pharmaceutical therapy over uh, surgical treatment in the long run for people. It has this niche. It has um, situations where it makes sense for people who cannot or will not have surgery or have unresectable problems or whatever. I get it, but it's not uh, a sea change. We're not going to go away from surgery, for example, and, and embrace a different therapy. But I, I'll tell you, it was really funny because I would go to the national meetings, particularly these are more medicine meetings, and people would pat me on the back and say, oh, I'm so sorry, but you won't be doing parathyroid surgery anymore. And, and I took that the wrong way, of course, I thought, really? And uh, I started investigating these things and discovered uh, just how uh, important it is to think through this problem uh, and take a step back, you know, to get this broader picture to understand, you know, what um, the costs are of the things that we do. Uh, and so that is really my, the, the beginning of, um, you know, my investigation into this and, and uh, continued to look at a number of other uh, surgical diseases and the various treatment options. And, and, you know, it's funny, but of course, the things that you know are true, uh, Mark, when we go to prove them, we always find that it's not true, right? <laughs> you know, you're certain that doing this or that is the right thing to do. Um, you have to have science or you have to have data uh, behind it to know that that's right. And I, I think uh, uh, everyone should continue to think in that way. We need to need to have data, we need to have proof. And it's been uh, kind of fun to, to look into these little things and determine uh, what they're actually doing uh, for patients. And uh, there's tons of examples I could go on and on, I suppose, but uh, that's how it all started. Great, um, so I think the biggest question and the thing that you, you just come away scratching your head is why thyroid cancer compared to these other what we perceive as physicians and certainly as a surgeon far more life-altering diagnoses um, and can you can you shed some light on the, on why you think thyroid cancer carries this much toxic financial toxicity yeah, again, this is one of those things that if I surveyed uh, people and said, which of the following cancers do you think would be the most financially devastating, people automatically pick uh, pancreas cancer or lung cancer or something that they perceive as being more aggressive, uh, more threatening to the person's life and, and, uh, and more rapidly progressive. It's exactly the opposite um, that uh, is true about uh, those things. So I, I highlighted a few of the reasons that I think uh, thyroid cancer patients have this higher burden. Uh, the first is that they are younger uh, in age, uh, and, and this is something like uh, one to two decades younger than uh, the other cancers that are common in the United States. And so those people are just at a different phase in life uh, where, uh, you know, you're still, maybe you're still paying off student loans if you're a physician, your surgeon, especially you, you could be 45 years old and still paying off loans, unfortunately, but you're, you are in a uh, different debt to income ratio, as I put it in the talk. Uh, you have dependents that rely upon you. You're trying to save for their future. You have loans that you're paying off. 
you're still in that maybe junior uh, position in your career and you're not making the big money like the senior people are doing. And um, the fact that I'll give you a business example, uh, a person who is going to be involved in a protractive, protracted, uh, lengthy treatment for you know some type of cancer, whatever it is. Uh, maybe that person that you know their their boss knows they're going to be out, knows they're dealing with things. Um, that person doesn't get the opportunities uh, to do the big project, to deliver uh, that presentation in front of the boss, or to go and. Uh, you know, become a leader in a particular area in their in their field or in their business, and and accumulate enough of those missed opportunities, and uh, look around, and everyone around you is is rising in the ranks, and you're still where you were. Um, so, where I think we're particularly vulnerable in the business world when we are in you know 30, 40, maybe even early 50s, uh, if you have a big setback. Uh, the other things that I highlighted were you're not you don't qualify for uh, government insurance, at least in the United States. You know, we have to wait until you're, you know, 65, basically, to qualify for Medicare. And so um, there are definitely many people who are in small businesses that are, are not required to have um, uh, employer based uh, health care uh, or maybe they have chosen a. Um, a, a healthcare policy that they can afford that is less costly on a monthly basis in terms of premiums, but covers less. And then when they get sick and they have to have surgery or, or you know, chemo or whatever, there's a big bill to pay, right? And so I, I think these are kind of the, the obvious ones, you know, the, the younger age and all the implications there. The other thing that I didn't get into in this talk, which is really interesting, if you take a look at um, you know, just in general, you know, name five cancers. Uh, and you ask, okay, well, where, where do we spend all the money? Like, where does it cost money in the treatment of these cancers? The majority of cancers, we spend the vast, the largest amount of money in the last year of life. Like patients are uh, declining and we're really throwing uh, everything we have at the cancer and and there's like a lot of costs in that last like final segment of life. And in thyroid cancer, it's exactly the opposite. We spend all the money right after we um, diagnose the cancer. So the diagnosis itself, the initial consultations, the operations that are done, uh, radioactive iodine and the other things that go around that. Uh, in that first 12 months or so, that's where the majority, maybe two thirds of the cost occurs in the first you know, part of their cancer journey and one third or less in the very end of their cancer journey. And, and remember, people don't typically die of this cancer. So the more people that we diagnose, the more money we spend right now and not down the road. And then finally, the, um, you know, we had this epidemic of thyroid cancer for uh, starting in 1999 in the United States uh, with, uh, you know, it was kind of in parallel with what we we're seeing in South Korea. And so people were being diagnosed more and more frequently as they had uh, maybe undergone more imaging studies and more incidental findings were found or ultrasound got better. People were maybe practicing more defensively and identifying all these small cancers. And just like they saw in, in South Korea, um, the identification and diagnosis of thyroid cancer uh, creates a fair amount of financial uh, requirement. Uh, whether you're the, from whatever perspective it is, if if a patient's on a on a, um, a, a universal healthcare plan or or you know some other type of healthcare plan, all of this new cancer diagnosis that was occurring primarily in young people again. Uh, was generating a huge amount of cost and burden. So just a perfect storm, I think, Mark, uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but if it were a cancer that um, uh, killed people very, very quickly or occurred only in the very elderly, we wouldn't see this at all. It's, it's because it happens in young people and they live essentially a normal length of life, but with everything that they have to go through. I have I have so many questions. I want to uh, give Camilo a chance to uh, uh, to to jump in here. Camilo, do you have a burning question here? I I do I do. I have um. I'm gonna deviate from the topic just a little bit, but bear with me because I'm gonna bring it back. Um, 
you spoke about overdiagnosis and then we, okay, we diagnosed a patient with thyroid cancer. And um, years ago, I mean, maybe decades ago, we used to treat patients very paternally, kind of telling them what to do. Now the shared decision-making uh, is has become a hot topic. And how do we incorporate, or I should say, how do you incorporate that discussion with the patient? Um, how do you incorporate economics into the decision-making of what do we do with heart thyroid cancer? Well, I, I would start out by saying I, we don't actually know. And this is one of the points I was making in, in one of the last slides is that we, we don't know the economics of lifelong observation versus um, a, a short period of time where patients are treated and then undergo surveillance. And then you determine, okay, this person has made it, you know, if you look at um, large databases in the United States, like the NCDB, for example, and you ask questions like, um, with what frequency does thyroid cancer recur and uh, how long does it take that to happen? What you find is that almost all, the vast majority of recurrences are detected in the first few years after the diagnosis. Um, and the, yeah, there's a, a few people who it's 20 years down the road that it's some recurrence, but this is very, very tiny now. If you, if, you, if you want to get through 95% or more of all recurrences, you get out five, six, seven years, it's happened already. And so trying to identify a rational time frame to, um, to put people into surveillance and look for recurrences is, is an important thing to do. Uh, and we've been kind of using five years for a long time, by the way. But um, if we compared the costs of that frame, uh, that time frame, the surgery, everything you do, all that surveillance. And then we're willing to say to people, you know what, you're fine. You'll have an annual you know, blood test, just like you do you know, for your cholesterol and everything else. Send the patient back to a specialist if, if thyroid goblin is going up or whatever, right? Uh, that can be compared to the cost of, um, you, know, you are gonna enroll in an active surveillance strategy at age 55. And right now, by the way, there is no end point to that stuff. Like the, the programs are doing this, it's in perpetuity. So we can do that math. I haven't done it. Nobody's, I don't think, done it well and, and see what the differences are. But in terms of discussing that stuff with patients right now, um, we don't have that to say, okay, this costs this and this costs that, or this will cost that much financial burden. I think another way to look at it though is, um, and I see this practice pattern more in the United States, I suppose. Uh, the active surveillance strategies are actually an excellent way uh, to defer to defer care. You know, to instead of thinking of it as active surveillance, think of it as, as some type of deference where I'm not going to have surgery right now. I'm going to do it maybe in two years or, or something like that. I'll be in some surveillance during this time. And then um, when that time passes, I'm gonna have you know, whatever treatment I need to be done. I think that you could look at and find some very um, useful type of information, like people at a certain age group, if they defer, if they don't have progression or whatever, what does that do economically to them? Again, hasn't been studied. But I think you can have an intervent, an in, like a like a one-on-one -on -one, you know, conversation with people and talk about these things. We could do surveillance, Here's what that would be like, and and these are the you know concerns around that or the costs, uh, and you know this is what you know cancer surgery is going to cost you and everything else, you know you know when this is happening all the time is when people are getting ready to retire but they don't quite qualify for Medicare and they're looking for you know what they can put off until they do qualify, but anyway I, I think we don't I don't have great data to answer your question. We certainly have to re respect patient autonomy and give them information so they know what they're getting into. And what did I say in this talk? Like only a third of patients, uh, maybe in some studies up to one half, ever have any kind of conversation that's meaningful with their doctor about what the you know money is going to look like, like how much it's going to cost for me to get through this. That, yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, sorry, Dr. Ken. Uh, um, you, you use the term of perpetuity, and, and I think that's a word that we seldom use or rarely read in, in a guideline because the guidelines have mortality, morbidity, now more, more often quality of life as an outcome. 
So how do we go about the recommendations that are using more technology, more resources every so often? And how do we incorporate that into the outcome of how we measure thyroid cancer? Well, I, uh... Again, I don't, I don't have a great answer for your question, but, you know, think about, we accumulate, at least in the United States, we accumulate, you know, 40,000 new patients every year with a diagnosis of thyroid cancer. And um, those patients, by and large, have a normal life expectancy. Around 2,000 people every year die in the United States from thyroid cancer. And so um, every year we add 40,000 and lose 2,000. We now have over 1 million uh, people living in the United States with a history of thyroid cancer. And uh, the vast majority of these people are expected to have a normal life expectancy and live, you know, uh, normal life. And so when we're writing guidelines and we're talking about treatments and stuff like that, it's not like pancreatic cancer. We actually have to assume the patients will survive the therapy and will go on to be more or less cured from their disease. And so thinking about it rationally like that and, and putting, you know, um, uh, putting uh, some type of bracket around uh, the parts of the treatment and surveillance that are more intense and allowing uh, patients to uh, graduate from that, I think would be important. Um, a couple, couple of quick points here. I, I immediately thought about um, the impact of gender on financial toxicity. How, how much of that um, can you peer, uh, parse out from the literature here? Um, obviously, um, breast cancer is also skewed uh, more towards women. Um, but uh, can you comment a little bit about the gender impact on, um, uh, on financial toxicity here? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, just for background, 75% of all thyroid cancer patients are women. And so this is an important, um, you know, thing, uh, the, you know, differences in gender. So uh, it, with that in mind, think of it like this, all that data that I just showed you, uh, almost 75% or more of the people who contribute that data are female. So uh, when like the, the Mangeli study actually was higher than that, it was like 90% of the respondents in their survey were female. So I think we actually have a pretty good look at um, how it is uh, for a mostly female population. Uh, and we don't have a great look at what it is for a male population, but the assumption is that it's, it's worse uh, just uh, based on the economic uh, status of, of women in the United States compared to men in general, in terms of earning power, earning potential, savings, et cetera. We think that they're probably uh, in a worse situation and more uh, vulnerable uh, to those things. What about, um, do you have any insights for, in terms of stage of, at diagnosis versus tox, um, the risk of financial toxicity here? You, you would imagine it's got to be tied, uh, tied to that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but think back, Mark, to maybe just 10, 15 years ago, uh, it didn't matter what your stage was. You, you got a total thyroidectomy and you got radioactive iodine. And when I started, there was one formula for treating papillary cancer, and it was total thyroidectomy followed by radioiodine, regardless of stage. You know, the patients that had a, a, a 10 millimeter papillary or a five centimeter papillary all got the same thing. And so back in those days, clearly there, there wouldn't have been a lot of difference in um, the financial toxicity based on stage because everybody got the same thing. Now, obviously we're being a lot more selective in um, you know, who gets a total thyroidectomy and who gets radioactive iodine. And uh, in addition to that, think of it this, this way too. Do you remember what it was like when uh, we had to give radioiodine to people? We took them off thyroid hormone for uh, at least four weeks, you know, they made a, they might have been on T3 for a few weeks, right? And then they were off everything for two or three weeks, and their TSHs would have to be at least 35 or higher. Their T4s are real low. They would say, "I feel like my arms weigh 100 pounds. I can't get off the couch." How effective of an employee is that person who's being withdrawn and is going through that 
period of hypothyroidism. And then do you also remember that we used to um, do this every year or I didn't do it. Endocrinologists did this on a yearly basis where they would withdraw people and do scans and else. I mean, that had to be really uh, debilitating to people and it had to really reduce their, of, uh, their ability to function uh, in their job, you know. Uh, a number of studies have looked at quality of life in uh, patients who are withdrawn versus being stimulated, and, and that appears to, to be a pretty significant difference, and now we see less and less of that, of course. But I bet you as we, as we progress and our, our treatments uh, for thyroid cancer become more nuanced and uh, more uh, very specific to the the, the type and stage of the cancer, we're going to see a separation. People who uh, have less intensive therapy end up having probably, you know, less diminished quality of life and, and less uh, impact on their financial burden. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that we had data from like 20, 30 years ago that would have shown anything because everyone was treated the same way, but it will, it will. And, and we just need to wait for that time to pass and, and study that. And I think we'll see it. But how much of your um, post-treatment surveillance are you doing through telemedicine now? Um, can you comment a little bit how, and I'm sure the pandemic has modified things, but how much of that are, um, are you doing purposefully uh, with finances in mind here? Yeah. So um, my practice is probably very different than a lot of uh, practices out there. Um, the telemedicine situation obviously just really exploded uh, in 2020. And uh, for quite a while, we weren't uh, doing any surgery at all. And then when we started to do operations, they were primarily on people who had cancers instead of benign diseases of the thyroid. And the first thing that we did to leverage telemedicine was we moved uh, all of the uncomplicated, you know, I'm doing great, I'm having no problem, uh, patients uh, to a telemedicine platform for their initial post-operative uh, visits. Um, so I'm not talking about day one, two, or something like that, but, you know, three or four weeks out from surgery, nobody was coming in uh, to see me and 100% of those people were on video. And uh, what we learned was that um, it was super satisfying to patients. And this isn't always the case in all settings of different diseases or whatever, but our patients felt like, oh, I don't have to drive downtown Chicago. I don't have to pay an outrageous parking fee. I don't have to take half a day off of work. I don't have to find somebody to watch my kids. I don't, you know, and, and we had you know, a, a pretty small uh, amount of time, maybe 10, 15 minute telemedicine thing and they moved on with their day. Remember, you have to remember, by the way, this is a little tangential, but our patients with thyroid cancer are more likely to have those real, real world situations, like who's gonna watch my kid when I go to see the doctor? I have to get time off of work or do this during my, my lunch hour, right? Then people who have, um, you know, the cancer patients who are in much older age brackets on average, like the thyroid, cancers versus pancreas or lung or whatever, like we talked about earlier. So it's a much more significant problem for our patients than some other oncologists. And uh, we continue to leverage that after, you know, this kind of in this semi post pandemic state that we're in now, and it's remained a very high um, driver satisfaction. Um, however, I think it is important to, for the patients to be seen in person at least twice a year um, in order to uh, conduct like just normal surveillance stuff like physical exam or ultrasound. And, and uh, I prefer at least in the initial few years to have every six months tumor markers on patients who've had a total thyroidectomy. And full disclosure, Mark, my, my practice skews towards more advanced disease. So I see people have bigger, worse, you know, more aggressive cancers. And so um, you know, I practice accordingly, right? But for people who have a eight millimeter PTC that was incidentally found in a thyroid lobectomy, um, that would be, I think, different uh, than than what I do just routinely for my patients. My last, my last question, I and it's more of a comment. I think while 
from a societal perspective, the idea of asking pathologists to not report um, those incidental findings, I think it's really a slippery slope. Um, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was just throwing that out as a as a controversial thing, and yeah. you know at what point um, you know how how intense does the macro the magnification need to be on a thyroid uh, specimen? I guess is the real question here, and uh, I think what I've learned is that uh, we all kind of as surgeons we think that they're looking at a hundred percent of the thyroid uh, when we take a thyroid out and send it to the pathologist. We just assume they're cutting the whole thing look at the whole thing and it's way far from the truth. They're looking yep. at 10% maybe of the gland or less and, and how they conduct that and what they should be looking for, I think is really the right question. Like how do you grow a specimen and, and what do you decide to take a look at to understand the background, what's going on in the parenchyma and the uh, primary or index lesion. Uh, that, that I think we could do more work on to understand that. But you, we've all seen patients that had an incidental microcarcinoma and got a completion thyroidectomy or radioiodine. And, and in retrospect, when you look at it, you're like, wow, the tumor burden was actually a one millimeter or, or something like that, you know, sure. feel bad in retrospect, right? So listen, the next time we have you join us, um, we're going to have to schedule out about a five hour session. Um, <laughs> I think this could go on and on and on and uh, really is um, I mean, I think there's so many aspects of this um, that uh, we I would love to be able to cover, uh, but unfortunately we can't do that this morning. Um, I, I want to thank you again on behalf of our entire thyroid and tyro community for uh, this really thought-provoking lecture, and um, wish you and all along uh, with everyone who's joined us uh, to have a, a really wonderful holiday and a happy and healthy new year. Thank you once again.